Hello and welcome to this new video on the introduction to the electrostatics of charged colloids in solution. So we are in the continuation of understanding what are the two um, basic and main interactions uh, at play in the DLVO theory uh, of colloids. So has, um, as I said in the first lecture, in most solvents, colloids acquire a charge on their surface. Okay, so it's exactly as depicted here. Here I've put pluses on the surfaces, but of course they can also acquire a negative charge. There is no, it really depends on the physical chemistry of the environment. So you would have a colloid 2 interacting with a colloid 1, and they would have respective surface charge densities, sigma 2 and sigma 1. Now, of course, the question we want to answer today is how do these particles interact? So, to understand that, let's uh, basically take a step back uh, and look at how two charge distributions, so surface charge distributions, sigma 1 and sigma 2, would actually interact in vacuum. So, if I have two spheres, two hollow spheres with just surface charges, um, on the on the outer rim, then I would get that they interact via the standard Coulomb potential. Okay, so it's K times Q1 times Q2 divided by R that would give you the electrostatic potential of interaction between these two objects. Now here I need to specify what is K, and I will do that in the um, uh, in the standard um, uh, unit system, so in the international system of unit, and in this system of unit, this is uh, one over four pi epsilon naught times r uh, epsilon naught. Sorry, and here epsilon naught is the dielectric permittivity of vacuum. Now, this equation, if you have two such uh, charge distribution with different radii, is valid provided r the center to center distance is bigger than R1 plus R2. Here Q1 and Q2 are the total charge respectively of uh, distribution 1 and distribution 2 and they are related to simply the area of the various spheres times the surface charge density. Now what happens when we put these two distributions in a particular medium? So now we put them in a medium and we'll try to say something under some uh, circumstances. So for example, if the medium is dielectric, homogeneous and isotropic, then the whole properties of the medium can be represented by a single number, epsilon m, which is the dielectric permittivity of this medium. Um, and in this particular case, then everything is simple and you get that the interaction between these two charge distributions is simply Q1 times Q2 divided by 4 pi epsilon m times r. Alright? Again, this is valid once uh, r is bigger than r1 plus r2 and with the values, I mean, also the expression for Q1 and Q2, which are like so. Okay, so is that it? Like, is it, is it finished? Have we, have we finished actually uh, dis deciphering how such uh, colloids would interact? Well, actually, no. Um, there is one big thing that we have forgotten. Uh, and what we have forgotten is that in, um, in all uh, solutions, and in particular when colloids are charged, then the uh, uh, surrounding environment will be uh, swarming with ions. Um, and so here I've put basically plus and minus ions, and, um, and you see that I've just looked at m uh, plus one and minus one ions, okay? So these are called monovalent ions. So that's what we are interested in. We want to figure that out. Now you could argue, oh, why would there be any ions in solution? Well, there are multiple reasons why there would be. The first one is that there could be salts that are dissolved in the solvent. So you know, very uh, uh, is a very common uh, table salt that would be NaCl, 
okay sodium chloride you've got also potassium chloride kcl then you've got hcl which is a very strong acid uh, kno4 etc uh, etc et so yeah, there are many salts that you know can be of course dissolved in solution uh, and each time uh, water for example is in contact with the air etc there would be ions and things dissolving in it even without you noticing now so that's one of the reasons there is another one which is that there are internal reaction within the solvents uh, itself that make ions appear so I don't want to delve into the chemistry but you probably know that HO minus plus A3O plus are in equilibrium uh, to give water molecules. What it means is that there is a chance for two water molecules to actually give rise to H3O plus and HO minus. So even in pure water you would end up with actual ions in solution. And finally if the colloids are charged they need to be charged somehow, right? So how do they acquire this charge in the first place? Either they would react with the solvent and therefore they would either gain some uh, something that would then create ions in the solvent or they would release themselves some ions and then therefore they would acquire a charge uh, because they are uh, initially neutral. Okay, so basically for neutrality of the whole system you have to have ions in solution if the colloids are charged. Okay, now the thing is how do we compute the interaction between uh, the uh, charge distribution uh, 1 and 2 uh, knowing that there are ions around them? Well, so we need here to go to something a little bit simpler for the time being. For, firstly, let's try to figure out what would be the potential created by all these guys. So the actual uh, charge distribution here on the left, that is with sigma, so here I just call it sigma, with, that is bigger than zero, so I've chosen positive for uh, as well for this example, and with the sa a same radius, which is R here. Um, and then you've got these ions, and I want to figure out what would be the actual potential at, at point M. Well, the problem here is that, as you see, the potential at point M will depend on all the positions of the ions, okay? Uh, including as well, of course, the position of the colloid, and so it would depend on all of this information. The issue with this is that, uh, is that ions are actually small objects. In fact, they are smaller than colloids, and so what that means is that they can actually jiggle around, okay, via thermal motion. So if they jiggle around, what that means is that you cannot actually uh, have a very definite value of the potential at point M. Okay, it's not possible. So we have to do something very similar to what we have done for Van der Waals interaction. We need to average over, uh, over basically all the possible configurations of the charges in order to get an average charge density um, in the uh, in solution and around the colloid. And the way we do that is basically by representing by a smeared, if you will, density of charge uh, or corresponding to the ions, which I'll call here rho E for electric charge, if you will, at a given, at a given point R. Now, the thing here is that I've represented something that looks like uniform charge distribution but it's not clear whether or not that's the case. In fact, if you look at the colloid, which has here a positive charge, then you will see that there are these ions, and in principle, they should interact via Coulomb interaction. Therefore, the uh, positive charge of the colloid should actually repel the plus ions and attract the minus ions. This would actually lead to uh, basically the minus ions gathering around the uh, positive, positively charged colloid and the pluses that are basically going further away from it. And also in smaller number because they, they of course contribute to the whole thing. So you need to have more minus ions because you need the whole thing to be neutral. Now what it gives in terms of 
the uh, so sorry so here what it does this thing is basically it polarizes the surrounding um, uh, ionic cloud okay so basically with minus on one side that are basically gathering around the colloid and then the plus is going uh, away from it now if you look at how it looks in terms of the map here you have that the electric uh, charge density is actually um, constant in this in this picture in terms of coloring, then it would become like this, okay? So you have a concentration of negative charges uh, around the particle, a halo of negative charges, and then you've got a smeared distribution of plus charges uh, further away from it, okay? Now, the thing here is that as you get these things, uh, here I've said that the actual distribution, instead of being constant, is equal to rho dh of r, where r here is the radial distance from the center of the colloid. It turns out that this rho dh here is meant to say the debye huckel uh, charge density. Um, and, um, and, and this debye huckel charge density looks like that. Okay, so it looks like a complicated expression, okay, for the charge density. But in fact, um, the, the, the only thing that matters here, um, here, this term here is, is just a, a prefactor, okay? It's a prefactor that ensures electron neutrality of the whole system, colloid plus ions, all right? So it does not contain much physics, it just ensures that the whole thing is electron neutral. What contains the physics of the problem is this term here, which tells you that the charge density decays exponentially and even faster because there is this one over r from uh, from the center of the colloid. Okay, so this tells you basically how sharply uh, it decays, and and that and basically it represents the fact that all these negative ions will be stuck on the on the colloid and then will decay away from it. The important bit here is something called the Dubai screening length. So as you see, the exponential goes as exponential minus r divided by lambda d. Lambda d is a typical length scale, so it's then called Dubai screening length, over which uh, essentially the, um, the charge density decays noticeably. And the only thing you see here is that it involves KBT, so this is again Boltzmann constant times the absolute temperature times the um, dielectric constant of the medium, so we have seen that already. The E here corresponds to the elementary charge of the um, electron, um, and then the uh, N ion infinity corresponds simply to the monovalent ion concentration infinitely far from the colloid. Okay, and then in this particular instance, you would have that the number of plus and minus is the same and that this this particular number. Now, the only thing that remains is to determine from there, from this charge density, how to get the actual potential. So, to do that, we remember that from Gauss law in electrostatics, there is a correspondence between the electric charge density rho and the corresponding potential. So here, if we have the dubai huckel ionic charge density associated to the charge of the colloid, we can get the dubai huckel potential associated to the whole distribution of charge. This dubai huckel potential uh, reads as Q effective divided by 4 pi times epsilon m and then times exponential minus r divided by lambda d divided by r. Now in this particular term, the Qf has to be seen here as uh, an effective charge of the colloid as if it were dressed with the ionic atmosphere, okay? And it reads as Q so the total charge of the colloid, exponential r divided by lambda d, and then divided by 1 plus r divided by lambda d. The, the right uh, on-site term is, of course, the most important one. It corresponds to the screen column potential. So what it tells you, in the end, is that if you have 
a colloid and then you've got ions surrounding it, then eventually what happens is that it renormalizes the uh, charge of the colloid, okay, because it's dressed now with counter ions or with uh, an ionic atmosphere, and then also it screens the Coulomb potential by adding an extra exponential minus r divided by lambda d, okay, which tells you that basically um, the um, potential is, is exponentially decreasing from the center of the colloid. Right, so now we can use that and try to figure out what is the actual per potential. Okay, so the potential between of interaction between these two uh, colloids or these two charge distributions in solution. So we go from this particular very complicated thing where you have all these ions and in principle they are all moving about, and then basically we replace that by the smeared atmospheres of charges around them. Okay, so here I've imagined that sigma two and sigma one are both positive. And then once you have that and you say that the, both of them give rise to a de Bajerkel potential, then when they are sufficiently far away from each other, you'll get that they interact via the so-called de Bajerkel pair potential. Um, and here it, it involves the effective charge associated to Q1, effective charge associated to Q2 that, that we saw in the previous slide. And of course this exponentially screened Coulomb uh, potential, okay, and this is the uh, the key element of how electrostatic happens in solution. It basically is screened by the free ions uh, in solution. So now that we have this uh, new insight about how electrostatic uh, happens, uh, let's say, or how does it behave in solution, now next time we'll be able to combine these two things into the full DLVO theory. Um, and wrap it up and then we'll see basically what can be done with it.